Hello and welcome to the India Today Mumbai Conclave. We've heard at length from the Indian government about the success of the G20 Leaders Summit. To get an outside perspective on how the rest of the world deconstructed what we saw in New Delhi during the G20 Summit, we've got here in Mumbai on special request the High Commissioner of the United Kingdom, Alexander Ellis. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us and it's a pleasure to have you. It's a great pleasure to be back. Thank you. I want to start by asking you about your and your country's impressions of the G20 summit. Uh, in India, the government has declared this to be a grand success. There was consensus on the joint uh, declaration that came out of the Delhi summit. In the way that you see it, in the journey of the G20, how do you assess the Delhi summit? I think you're absolutely right to put it in the context of the G20 overall. I think really India broke the mold on what a G20 presidency is, and I feel for subsequent presidencies because India sets the standard. Getting an agreement at the summit was a remarkable achievement. I think very few people thought it was possible, uh, and I think that tells you something about the capability and the craft of the Indian system. I also think it tells you something about Indian power. Um, the kind of planet India is getting bigger, its mass is getting bigger. And so it, as its gravitational pull, I think, is getting bigger, bigger. You can see that in lots of different ways. And people did not, countries did not want to get on the wrong side, I think, of the Indian presidency. And so it could achieve something which I wonder if any other country could achieve at the moment, which is to get, we have a very divided world, but to get all those different countries to align behind a single text. You know, we have some images of... Uh Prime Minister Sunak and Akshita Murthy coming to India during the G20 summit, and I'm sure all of you would have seen it as well. Uh, Prime Minister Sunak's popularity back home in the context of the elections next year is uh, something that he's working very hard to salvage. But in India, he had smashing popularity. I mean, just pressing all the right buttons, there they are at the Akshardham temple. Uh, the Canadian Prime Minister had a different kind of reception the British Prime Minister was smashing all records. What were you in the High Commission making of the kind of warm reception the son-in-law of India was getting while he was here? Well, it was amazing to see and amazing to be alongside the Prime Minister and Mrs. Murthy. And it was great that they came together. I think that has a lot of impact when there is a couple are together. And you saw the enormous interest which, of people here in them. The fact that they are living in number 10 Downing Street uh, and are drawing deer, you know, lighting deer and drawing uh, Rangoli outside of Downing Street tells you something about the, my country, which is a very different country from the one I grew up in. That's a fast change, but I think it's a remarkable change. And that attracts interest in the UK, attracts interest here. It actually attracts interest all over the world. Uh, and it was wonderful to see. They were very well received here as well. And also, I think they really enjoyed it. It's very interesting to see how Prime Minister Sunak wears his religion on his kurta. Yeah. Most people would be very low-key about it, you know, keep religion as private. In those images from the Akshardham and even what he does back home, yeah. whether it's with the cow, and as you said, it says a lot about British politics at this time, for him to be Prime Minister and for it to be acceptable to people at large. How do you see that having changed? Because I studied in the UK, many people sitting here would have spent a lot of time in the UK. Yeah. It really has changed since. It really has. What's so interesting in the UK is that it's just not an issue. Um, uh, and uh, the Prime Minister, I also admire him because he doesn't sort of play one game at home and one game abroad. He just is himself. Um, he is completely relaxed about it, open about it. And the response in the UK, I think, tells you something about how much the country has changed. It just does not figure as an issue in the UK. What they look for from the Prime Minister is what every country looks for from the Prime Minister, which is you know, competence, uh, leadership, and so forth, and that's as it should be. And I am I'm very proud, actually, to represent a country which has changed so much. And it's not just the Prime Minister. If you saw King Charles's coronation, in a way, the kind of core of the British state, you had uh, people from different faiths, um, artifacts from different faiths. It was something quite extraordinary to see, and that tells you something about the country I live in, or country and I'm and from. And it gives Indians, many sitting here and otherwise, some level of vicarious pleasure that a son-in-law of India is trying to fix the broken British state? We could unpack that statement. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, you know, Rishi Sunak is, is, is as British as I am. Um, uh, and uh, what he has is 
some style and taste and culture which is very identifiable here. He's a Hindu, um, a practicing Hindu. Uh, he loves his ladus, I discovered, and I was enjoying a few when he was here. Um, but uh, he is just, he reflects You are telling us that he has ladus with most meals? Oh, God, I just, he does like, he does like a kaju cutli, actually. We're having a very good kaju cutli when we're preparing for a, uh, uh, preparing for a, for a meeting. And, but he just, He's both a leader, but he's also reflecting a change in British society, and you see it in lots of different ways. And I think we are a stronger, healthier society for that. And I think, I think it's quite incredible, all jokes aside, because it's taken so many people of Indian origin to go and run uh, American uh, tech companies, and they're, trying, and they're doing a stellar job. So it feels really nice, but of course, as you said, he is uh, fully British, and the British people have accepted him, and that's most important. Everybody else is just on the sidelines commenting on the match, but they're not playing the match. I want to come to the tricky issue of Khalistan, mm -hmm. where we saw quite disturbingly the Indian High Commissioner, Mr. Dorai Swami, in Scotland getting heckled by some separatists. And from what I hear, those separatists haven't been arrested and the, from the reports that I read from the Scottish media, they don't seem to have think anything big happened. So something happened which absolutely should not have happened. Um, and our ministers have been very clear about that, uh, both publicly and in private. Uh, you have to put individual incidents within a context. Uh, first of all, that context is the extraordinary diversity of the UK now. Uh, we've just been talking about it in relation to the Prime Minister and the extraordinary achievements of the community of Indian heritage in the UK, which is frankly fantastic. Uh, about 1.5, 1.6 million people achieving in every walk of life, uh, represented in our parliament, uh, represented in all sorts of fields in the British state. So that's a great thing. Um, second thing is that extremism is an issue in many countries and Actually, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, when he was here, was very clear, we do not tolerate extremism in any form. <coughs> there are always going to be a few folk who are going to be the extreme ends. Um, and how we deal with that, I think we deal with it in different ways. Uh, we do arrest people, I should say the police have the powers to arrest people and exercise them. We had a demonstration outside the Indian High Commission on Monday, I think. Somebody was arrested there. There, actually was, there was an arrest. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, when we had the uh, demonstration back in March, I think it was. But there, uh, the Indian government gave images of those who were part of the protests and the vandalism, and again, nothing happened. So this is something that many people watching and sitting here don't seem to understand. If there are people who are advocating secession, picking up the gun, fomenting <coughs> trouble, sponsoring terrorism, Britain, more so Canada, but also Britain, just doesn't seem to do enough. Well, if they were causing terrorism uh, on British soil, then the British point of view would be very different. So let's again unpack that a bit. So first of all, things do happen, and they do happen. We arrested the police. First of all, it's not the government's job. It's the police decide who they're going to arrest and not they're going to arrest. And then you go to a court, and the court decides ultimately on conviction or otherwise. Uh, we, there was an arrest uh, in March. There was an arrest on Monday. <clears throat> there are other ways in which the uh, British authorities can act where they see extremism and again of any form, for example, closing down TV stations, for example, closing down charities, for example, closing down schools, none of which are what they say they are. I give those examples because in all those cases, the British authorities have acted. Um, the other thing that happens is to strengthen the security around the people and the buildings of uh, India in the United Kingdom. Uh, and that has happened as well. There's been a clear increase in security. What you won't hear about is the many demonstrations which have taken place since March outside the Indian High Commission, which have taken place without incident because of very effective policing. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm having that change of season, cough and cold, which everyone will be familiar with. So things do happen. We have a very good communication with the Indian authorities. We have created a joint extremism task force. But <coughs> as our own security minister said when he came here, extremism is not an Indian problem. It's a British problem. If we are seeing young British, mainly men, radicalized, that is a problem in our society and one we have to and we do deal with. So beneath the headlines, actually, we do act. 
Uh, we talk all the time to the Indian government. The police, obviously independent, make their own judgments, but we take it seriously. And that's why we have taken the measures we have, whether in terms of security or in other ways to frustrate unacceptable extremism in my country. So what's your message as a country that's part of the Five Eyes uh, to Ottawa and to the government in Canada in terms of how they're handling the same issue? They don't seem to be doing quite as much as uh, the UK's. Uh, I think uh, any uh, British High Commissioner should be focusing on Britain, U UK, India. Um, what I think is it takes a lot of effort at a lot of levels and also communication between countries about how things work. What, uh, you know, how, what is, for example, we've had judges out here talking to, British to Indian authorities about sort of evidence which be accepted in a British court, stuff like that. Quite sort of down-to-earth cooperation. And it's a permanent process, but we should never lose sight of the enormous benefits we get in the United Kingdom from having a very diverse population which contributes a great deal to my country. And I always want to look at the good, the vast majority good, as well as dealing with the occasional bad. One of the things that's been in the news of late is the decision uh, of your country to increase visa fees for Indians, uh, visa fees in general and particularly Indians, the process becoming more complicated and costlier than earlier. Uh, you're right, we have increased the uh, visa fees. Um, our visa is still very competitive. Our process, in my view, is outstanding. Uh, we are clearing the very vast majority of all the visa applications within 15 working days. The good news is demand for visas is enormous. Uh, we issued 500, over 500,000 visit visas uh, over the last year, 140,000 student visas. These are record numbers. Uh, over 50,000 skilled worker visas, but one third of all the visas we issue are to Indian nationals, and demand is enormous. Um, we have a, a system which we're always trying to improve that requires investment, so the fees go up, but we are still very competitive. And luckily, people are still wanting to come to the UK. Oh, sure. The other thing <laughs> that we're noticing is that the number of students going to the UK, a few decades ago, the UK was the number one choice uh, for Indian students wanting to study abroad. Now other countries are catching up sure. and overtaking the United Kingdom as well. Why do you think that is happening? And what's your government doing to try and maintain the competitive advantage of universities and colleges in Great Britain to attract students from India? I believe in competition. So it's great that you have competition. I think it's much better for the students, international students in general. But I should say that the UK is surging enormously in the number of students we get coming to, from India to the United Kingdom. India is now the number one source of international students, overtaken China. <coughs> we have record numbers this year because we have a very good offer. People like coming to the UK, the quality of the universities, even you, I think, Rahul, may have been tempted by the quality of the university in the UK. Um, so, uh, Actually, the numbers show enormous demand and growing demand. Part of that is because people like to work after they've um, uh, studied in the UK, and the UK allows for that as well. I would guess the US will probably be number one in the world for attracting international students. The UK is very close behind. We're up to about 700,000. Uh, that's a very high number, and that's because of the quality of the offer. And long may it continue, but long, long there may also be competition, because that's what drives improvement in our universities as well. What I would like to get more of, though, is young Brits coming here. One of my aims is to set up something which gets more young Brits to see the real new India of today and tomorrow. I had that experience when I was 18. Our Minister of Justice, our Lord Chancellor, who's, uh, he had that experience when he was 22. Our Finance Minister, Jeremy Hunt, came here when he was 18. I think we need more folks coming over to see what India is like today. So what does India look like to you now relative to what it looked like when you'd come in your teens. You were in Madhya Pradesh, right? I was, yeah, that's right. I lived in Indore. I went back there the other day. I taught in the school. Um, India is, has incredible cultural depth. It's the oldest country I've ever lived in. Um, but it also has this extraordinary modernity. So it's a most unusual combination of the two. And what I'd like people to see is that modernity. Um, you know, the extraordinary changes going on in the country in the last 20 or 30 years. And the sense that people always talk to, oh, the India story, it'll happen. We're in it now. Yeah? It's not the next chapter, it's this chapter. We had uh, Borje Brande, the president of the World Economic Forum, at one of our summits recently, and he spoke of India becoming a $10 trillion economy in the next 10 years, and the geopolitics of the world, in his view, being defined by a G3. 
uh, the US, China and India. Is that too presumptuous you think or do you think inevitably that's the way the stars are aligning? I think power does come from economic power and India's is transforming at the moment. Um, I think India has rightly got that ambition to become you know, third biggest economy in the world. It will become the third biggest economy in the world. As I said, it's magnetic pull. You can feel it increasing. I'll go back from here. I'll go to see the board of Barclays Bank uh, coming here back in Delhi this evening because people want to come to India. Everybody wants to come to India. Um, uh, the G20, we had over a dozen ministers coming here just to see what India is like. By the way, one of the very good things about the G20 was it allowed ministers to see the reality of India today. Um, so that economic power will come. In my view, no country can do that alone. Uh, if you look at the very best in the world, Niraj Chopra. Yeah? Niraj Chopra, he's Indian, he comes from a fantastic uh, background in Haryana. He trains in the UK, amongst other places, to become excellent. To become excellent, you need international competition and you need to be the, the very best. And I think India is attracting the very best and should continue to do so. I think India will be one of the three defining countries of the rest of my life, of my lifetime. Um, uh, what happens in India on environment, what happens in India on health, what happens in India on food security, all those things will define what happens in the world, alongside, I agree, China and the United States. That is a very exciting prospect for India. It's also a change in the way the world works. A generation ago, I started diplomacy, the richest countries in the world are the most powerful. That has changed. And India isn't setting essentially a new paradigm for how you exercise power at the same time as you drive internal development. I am delighted that the High Commissioner is cheering for Neera Chopra, which is fantastic. You're pressing all the right buttons as a diplomat. I also hope in the same way you will be rooting for Rohit Sharma and the Indian team rather than the English team, sir. Now he's British first. No, no, no. I'm, no uh, well, it, there are many things it, you it learn. It doesn't go that far. It, there are many things you learn in India. One is the value of not speaking and just rolling your head a bit. <laughs> uh, India should be, I think, their favourites, uh, marginal favourites for the World Cup. Uh, your team is? And I, I think India probably is. Home advantage No, matter. we want you to think your favourites. Uh, I will always put India uh, as the favourite. I think England has a very strong team. England is the holding champion, is the, is, is the reigning champion at 50 overs, it's the reigning champion at 20 overs. It has an outstanding side. We were terrible, terrible uh, um, at one day cricket for about 10, 20 years, but now we're back and very strong. Uh, you need good spinners. I think it was Rajdeep Sardasai was saying that to me, and he thinks he's right. New Zealand have some good spinners, we have good spinners. You need power in the middle order. Five, six, seven uh, have to score fast in very few balls. And that's interesting to see from India. I think they have great opening batsmen. I think they have a desperate boom rub. They have the X factor. Can they get the, the power through the middle order? But I think that getting our Ashwin back is a very good thing for India because he has the craft to bowl good spin. It's fantastic. I like the depth and the passion. Uh, and it must really be like that. It can't be any other way. So it's fantastic. I, you play some cricket yourself, sir? I do. Um, you bat, uh, you bowl, you field. Yeah, sadly, I think that my chance of getting into the England squad is looking small at the moment, although I'm always available um, and ready to play. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. Um, uh, it's, I still play. It's a great game. It's lovely playing in India, actually. It's a very different experience. Uh, going to the games is fantastic. I'll be at the uh, opening match tomorrow in Ahmedabad. Um, I'll try and get to uh, see them England play in Delhi. I'll try and get to Kolkata as well. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to see different parts. And also, I've actually played at Eden Gardens, but I've never watched a game there. And that wow. has to be on the bucket list of things you do in India. Fascinating. Very fascinating. We're very happy for England to do really well till it comes to the finals or whenever it comes across India and lose. I mean, till then, we are very delighted for England to do really well. They Thank have been uh, setting the benchmark, which hasn't been the case, as you yourself said, yep. uh, for a long time. They're a formidable team. We're just trying to keep expectations very low. The problem with India and Indians is we get carried away about, this, you know, about the possibility of our team doing well with people like you saying, oh, you're favorites. We don't want to be favorites. We just no, want no, to go no out and play well. Yeah, yeah. We just want to go out and play well. I see you watch a lot of Hindi movies. I do, I do. I should have mentioned just before we get off, the, uh, the other thing we have is Ben Stokes. Uh, and uh, when you get into the knockout games, if we, England gets to a semi-final or a final, which I hope they will, I was at the 2019 final when I saw what Stokes did in that final. By the way, I was at the 1983 final as well. Mm. That was a good game to go to. Um, Hindi movies, uh, I'm trying to learn Hindi. 
the G20 has not been kind to my Hindi. Why is that? Because it's so much work. G20 बहुत काम दिया. Fantastic. तो कितनी अच्छी आपकी Hindi? मेरी Hindi, मेरी Hindi आज का मेरी Hindi खराब है. मेरे मेरे शिक्षिका बहुत गुस्सी हैं क्योंकि गुस्सा है गुस्से हैं क्योंकि हर दिन में G20 मंत्री आते हैं कम करता हूँ इसलिए मेरी हिंदी नहीं तो कितना अभ्यास करते हैं आप कितनी प्रैक्टिस करते हैं हिंदी बोलने <laughs> Not enough, um, uh, क्योंकि मैं एक कक्ष करता हूँ हर हर हफ्ते हर हफ्ते more or less um, uh, but it's uh, language uh, requires work and I haven't worked hard enough so I'm going to try and get use the World Cup to get my cricket, cricket Hindi back in shape uh, the first words in Hindi I learned here were actually playing cricket koi bat nahi, koi bat nahi, as I dropped another catch it was so embarrassing uh, so uh, I, I might try and use the World Cup and I welcome any suggestions of good phrases to learn for cricket नहीं अगर इंग्लैंड सही टाइम पे इंडिया से हार जाए तो हम लोग सब कहेंगे कोई बात नहीं आई नॉट इवन गन रिस्पॉन्ड टू दैट इट्स लाइक आई एम अ डिप्लोमैट आई नो वेन द बॉल इज स्विंग आउटसाइड दी ऑफ स्टॉम आई कैन जस्ट कीप माई बैट इन आई डोंट नीड टू स्टिक माई बैट आउट वी लेट्स टोक्स डू द रेस्ट आई वेरी वाइज सो वॉट हिंदी फिल्म यू वॉच रिसेंटली Um, I uh, I the, watched uh, Shole again the other day. What else? So Shole or Chole? <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, that, that's all right. I make mistakes all the time. I've been watching Panchayat, the series, which is really good, fantastic series, and also good for my Hindi as well. Um, uh, I was watching oh, what's the show with uh, Saif Ali Khan? Um, uh, um, the other Saif Ali Khan. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, Bombay, help me. The Sacred one, games? Yeah, Pedro Games. That was a very, it's a very good show, and I, I know Safe from times past, so it's very nice to see. I, I must admit, I've been switched. I switched a little bit back into English to watch um, uh, Barbie, and uh, uh, which was a fantastic film, as well as Oppenheimer. So I'm pretty eclectic in my taste. I haven't yet. I've watched Gangs of Wasseypur, Part One. Learned some very interesting vocabulary from that film. Uh, maybe more for the cricket pitch than. Uh, the, Uh, and I, every, people, people say part two is very good as well. Actually, it's a beautifully made film, so I might try and watch part two next. I have a suggestion for you. Your Hindi is a very good way to watch your Hindi channel in a day. We will also see the Hindi channel in a few hours. Hi, Commissioner Sahib, you have come. You have come about our country, about our Sanskrit, about our language, 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 about our language. हिंदुस्तानियों को वहां पे इतनी जगह मिल रही है बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आपका बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू ऑल द बेस्ट यू रियली वेल इन द वर्ल्ड कप जस्ट टेल लेडीज एंड जेंट्स एंड कंपनी थैंक यू सर थैंक यू